Let us begin another week of our four-and-a-half-year verse-by-verse journey through all of God's inspired Word by opening to Ezekiel chapter 28. And I'd like you to go ahead and roll back to uh, verse number 11. We talked about this as we were closing last time, but I think it's important enough material that we need to at least refresh our minds that it is here as we kick this new week off. Ezekiel was in exile. He was up near Babylon City, and God was using him to make declarations against many of the kingdoms of the Middle East that were coming under his judgment, often for the way that they had treated Israel. Tyre was one of those places that was coming under judgment, and it's because they had had a bad attitude in recent generations against the kingdom of Israel in the north and the southern kingdom of Judah. And the king of Tyre was, understandably, uh, the mechanism by which a lot of that uh, animosity was directed toward Israelis. So God speaks out against the king of Tyre. But in so doing, it would appear that he was prophetically speaking to Satan as well, the one who had caused so much trouble, not just simply for Israel, but for all of humanity. Okay, so with that in mind, let's look at this again. It is directed against the king of Tyre, and much of what is said is about his pride and the trouble he causes. But behind that man... There is the entity that is the enemy of our souls. Ezekiel 28, verse 11. Moreover, the word of he who is came to me, Son of man, raise a lamentation, a sad song, over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says he who is God, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. So immediately with that phrase, we know that's not true of the king of Tyre. He is only a much more uh, modern uh, entity, whereas Satan himself was in existence back at the time of the Garden of Eden. Every precious stone was your covering. Uh, and then it goes through the lists of the stones there. Uh, and uh, they were crafted in gold with your settings and your engravings. Um, in some of the English versions, it sounds a little bit like musical instrument information at this point, but I go more with the idea of an allusion to he's like a living jewel. Uh, he is made up, he is physical, if you want to call that, because he, he actually lives in another dimension than our physical world. Uh, but his body is made up, apparently, of crystalline uh, material. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian garub, or fencing garub. Garub, in some of the other Middle Eastern languages, has the sense of someone or something that does blessing uh, or that prays. And so I think that's probably the same sort of thing here is that somehow the Kedrovim are related to prayer. And we know that in uh, the vision of Ezekiel of God's Shekinah glory, his, his tower where his throne was located, there were four Kedrovim right below his throne. And in their midst, there were these glowing stones, these stones of fire, uh, that seem, again, to be related to prayer. I, I like to relate them to the book of Revelation, where the prayer altar is beneath the throne of God as well. So you were an anointed guardian Kerub, not true of the king of Tyre, but certainly uh, could be true of Satan. I placed you. Uh, you were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. Uh, the Holy Mountain, probably a reference to the Garden of Eden again, uh, this idea of the place where God was uh, in command. 
And so Satan, apparently at his beginning of existence, was there in the Garden of Eden. Verse 15 says, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. And that's where the fall of Satan takes place. Uh, I told you at the time uh, that we were looking at this on Friday that Isaiah chapter 14 does a similar thing where it is speaking against the king of of Babylon uh, in chapter 14. And when you get down to chapter 12, uh, where the king of Babylon has been condemned for his braggadocious attitude, his, his pride, it suddenly starts talking about the one who is behind the king of Babylon, uh, the person who is full of pride. And that's an entity of great pride. Verse 12 of Isaiah 14 says, How you have fallen from heaven... Halel, that's the Hebrew. Lucifer is the Latin. And I know we soften up that hard k sound in the middle of his name um, whenever we've got later Latin and call him Lucifer. But Lucifer just means the lighted one or the enlightened one. Halel means exactly the same thing. Uh, the brilliant one, as in light. Um, Lucifer in Latin and Halel in Hebrew both are used to refer to the planet Venus in the sky as the third brightest astronomical object. Sun followed by moon followed by Venus. Uh, So he is the day star, that's Venus, son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. And then verse 13 is, I think, the attitude that Satan copped at the time he was in the Garden of Eden. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. Uh, Stars here can be poetically uh, a reference to the angels of God. Uh, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the far reaches of the north. Uh, Poetically, the northern mountain for most of these lands was considered the mountain where God reigned from. And so in uh, Israel proper, Mount Hermon uh, was sometimes looked at in that respect. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. So these are the, I think it's the seven I wills that are related with Satan's uh, rebellion against God. And there are traditions that say the reason he did this is because he didn't understand or want to accept the idea that mankind, made in the image and likeness of God, but made a little lower than the angels themselves in capability, should be honored as the one in the image of God. And therefore, he rebelled and tried to take mankind down. Uh, And that's the uh, Genesis 3 story as to how this whole war started. Now, the Isaiah passage, which we're only just kind of looking at quickly, uh, then continues with, that's why you were brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. And so pride brought Satan down, just like pride bought, brought down the king of Babylon, uh, and pride brought down the king of Tyre, and uh, Tyre in Ezekiel 28 uh, is uh, backed up uh, by Satan and the description of him being a prideful individual or entity. So let's go back to Ezekiel 28 and continue, verse 16. Uh, In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O garden, Kerub, uh, from the midst of the stones of fire. So Satan is ejected from his former relationship um, among the Kerubim of God. Uh, He might have actually been related to the throne of God there in the Garden of Eden, but now he's removed from that uh, and cast out of God's regular presence. Uh, He comes back from time to time, and I would describe a 
parole hearing, such as in the book of Job, where he uh, comes with all the other angels uh, to present himself before God. But now we go back to the description of the king of Tyre and how his pride took him down. Verse 17, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. By the multitude of your iniquities, in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. So I brought fire out from your midst. It consumed you and it uh, uh, turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. So Tyre is going down, and it does come down uh, under Nebuchadnezzar's attack. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You've come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. So Tyre comes down first under Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Alexander the Great kind of finishes the project, uh, and uh, Tyre ceases to be a powerhouse. Uh, that it once was from that time forward. Now, Tyre is often associated with another Phoenician city, uh, not very far from it, and that's Sidon. So it shouldn't surprise us a bit that Sidon is also highlighted in these condemnations from God through Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28.20, The word of he who is came to me, Son of man, Set your face towards Sidon, prophesy against her, and say, Thus says he who is God. Behold, I'm against you, O Sidon, and I will manifest my glory in your midst. They shall know that I am he who is and manifest my holiness in her. For I will send pestilence into her and uh, the uh, uh, blood into her streets And the slain shall fall in her midst by the sword that is against her on every side. Then they will know that I am he who is. So God's judgment is going to bring disaster to the city-state of Sidon, just like to Tyre. Verse 24, here's the why. Um, And for the house of Israel, there shall be no more a briar to prick or a thorn to hurt them among all their neighbors who have treated them with contempt, then they will know that I am he who is God. So the reason they were in trouble, the reason Sidon and Tyre were in trouble, is because they'd been a thorn in the side of Israelis. And so they were now going to be taken down and not be around to bother them uh, officially in the future. Verse 25, thus says he who is God, When I gather the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered, so now we jump ahead with a prophecy, to after the exile is over with, after God's time out against the Judeans is finished. When I gather the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered and manifest my holiness in them in the sight of the nations, Then they shall dwell in their own land that I gave to my servant Jacob. So we have here a prophecy about the return. There are several of these prophecies throughout many of the uh, prophetic books of the Old Testament. And we know it came to pass that under Cyrus the Great, his name is going to be coming up a lot more as we move forward in our histories. Cyrus the Great ordered that any Israeli could go back to the land of their heritage and be reestablished there. And so the nation of Israel gets a fresh start. The righteous remnant becomes uh, a, a seed stock from which God starts over everything that will then lead to the coming of the Messiah. And we should bring up that It will not be until the Messiah comes back that the fullness of these prophecies of restoration will happen. Verse 26, they shall dwell securely in it, that is in the land. They shall build houses and plant vineyards. They shall dwell 
excuse me, they shall dwell securely when I execute judgments upon their neighbors who have treated them with contempt. Then they will know that I am he who is God. So they'll be much more open to God being their God once they come back from the Assyrian and the Babylonian exiles. But the permanent solution to the problems of Israel will happen after the Messiah comes the first time to pay for sin by his death and his resurrection. And then it will be followed up by his second coming where the bodies will be redeemed, where the creation itself will be redeemed and the unrighteous ones will be removed from the, uh, the equation altogether. And so that is also hinted at, I think, in this passage. Uh, let's fast forward past uh, some of these prophecies from another period to chapter number 30 and uh, verse number 20. Chapter 30, verse number 20, which has a date assigned to it. In the 11th year, in the first month, on the seventh day of the month. So this is the 11th year of Jehoiakim's exile, that's the dating by which uh, Ezekiel relates things, because that's also the time he left uh, the promised land and went into exile. Uh, so the uh, first month, seventh day, uh, so about a week before Passover uh, should have happened. Uh, so we're talking about April of 588 B.C. The word of he who is came to me, son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, this is Apris, uh, who had recently been uh, ascended to the throne of Egypt. He had just recently become Pharaoh, and he almost immediately marched north into Judah in order to try to attack the Babylonian army that was besieging Jerusalem because basically the Pharaoh wanted Babylon out of his backyard. But what happened was Nebuchadnezzar's army disengaged from their siege for a short period of time to wipe the floor with the Egyptian army. And so this is the broken arm of Pharaoh that we're talking about here. So, son of man, I've broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Behold, it's not been bound up to heal it by binding it with a bandage so that it may become strong to wield the sword. So, they did great damage to the Egyptian army. In fact, they kind of precipitated some internal strife in the kingdom of Egypt. Uh, by getting beat so badly by the Egyptians. Verse 22, Therefore, thus says he who is God, Behold, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. I will break his arms, both the strong wind and the one that was broken. I will make the sword fall from his hand. So God's not done punishing Egypt either. They also will suffer under judgment. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them through the countries. We've seen this predicted as well, that many of the Egyptians that get caught up as POWs and refugees uh, during the coming Nebuchadnezzar assault upon uh, Egypt, they will go into exile and they won't be able to come back to their homeland for a very long time. Verse 24, I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, put my sword in his hand, but I will break the arms of Pharaoh, and he will groan before him like a man mortally wounded. I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, but the arms of Pharaoh shall fall. Then they shall know that I am he who is when I put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he strikes it out or stretches it out against the land of Egypt. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. Then they will know that I am he who is. Now, this is not a complete and absolute exile for the Egyptians, but a large number of them will 
be relocated. And it was be, it's going to be because God's got uh, his own condemnation uh, to be carried out against the land of Egypt. Uh, now, let's go to the next chapter for our next dated material. Chapter 31, verse 1. In the eleventh year, in the third month, on the first day of the month. So now we're past Pentecost of that year and getting close, to, excuse me, we're past Passover of that particular year and getting very close to Pentecost, which almost always happens during the first week of the third month of the Jewish year. And so we're looking at here of June, the beginning of June of 588 B.C. So at that time, the word of he who is came to me. Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitudes. So God's got a message now that is going to probably be sent by messenger uh, all the way down to Egypt from Babylon, where Ezekiel is located. And it's, uh, it takes the form of a question and then an extended uh, illustration of the significance of that question. Whom are you like in your greatness? So, Egypt, Pharaoh, who do you think you should be compared to? Verse 3, Behold, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon with beautiful branches and forest shade, and of towering height, its tops among the clouds. So God says to Pharaoh, pay attention. Do you think you're like Assyria, the last big power player before the Babylonians? Uh, and uh, the Egyptians actually tried to be allies with the, with the uh, Assyrians, trying to uphold them. And so God says, let's talk about Assyria. Let's talk about what happened to them as an illustration of what's going to happen to you. They were like a great big tree. Verse 4, the waters nourished it. The deep made it grow tall, making its rivers flow around the place of its planting, sending forth its streams to all the trees of the field. And so it towered high above all the trees of the field. Its boughs grew large, its branches long from abundant water in its shoots. All the birds of the heavens made their nests in its boughs. Under its branches, all the beasts of the field gave birth to their young, and under its shadow lived all great nations. So Assyria once was the big tree in the forest of the, of the world and of the Middle East. Uh, it was beautiful in its greatness, in the length of its branches. <coughs> Excuse me. For its roots went down to abundant waters. Assyria uh, had uh, its roots there in Mesopotamia, the land of two rivers, uh, part of the Fertile Crescent. The cedars in the garden of God could not rival it, nor the fir trees equal its boughs. Neither were the plane trees like its branches. No tree in the garden of God was its equal in beauty. So it was a beautiful and splendid tree of the nations. I made it beautiful in the mass of its branches, and all the trees of Eden envied it that were in the garden of God. Verse 10, Therefore, thus says he who is God, because it towered high and set its top among the clouds, and its heart was proud of its height, I will give it into the hand of the mighty one of the nations. He shall surely deal with it as its wickedness deserves. I'll cast it out. Foreigners, the most ruthless of nations, have cut it down and left it. So what we're seeing here is a reminder that Assyria has already been toppled by the Babylonians and their allies. And Egypt, though it thinks it's strong like Assyria, is also going to be whacked at. On the mountains and in all the valleys, its branches have fallen. Its boughs have been broken in all the ravines of the land, and all the people of the earth have gone away from its shadow and left it. So Assyria has been abandoned. On its fallen trunk dwell all the birds of the heavens, and on its 
branches are all the beasts of the field. All this is in order that no trees by the waters may grow to towering height or set their tops among the clouds, that no trees that drink water may reach up to them. In 